is part three of a closer look at Korsakoff syndrome. Well, I'll be discussing um, some issues surrounding treatment and prognosis. So treatment, I tend to conceptualize in two different phases, uh, in terms of emergency treatment and after the initial crisis. So in an emergency setting, um, again, this is assuming that the person is caught in the very early stages. Someone notices a change in behavior or notices um, that they've been isolated and not taking care of themselves, or they come in for um, treatment for alcohol or substance abuse, and we see the signs um, as soon as they uh, start to experience alcohol withdrawal. Uh, emergency treatment, they're typically going to receive an injection of thiamine. Uh, oral doses are not going to catch up, so it's going to be an intermuscular shot of thiamine, and we're going to continue that dose for anywhere from two to five days. Um, or if the person is severely malnourished, they might go right to IV thiamine and other nutrients, um, depending on, again, what their body needs, what else is going on with them. Then uh, physically, they're going to be monitored and supplemented with fluids and nutrition to help the body recover. And typically, we want to avoid glucose um, because uh, we have just seen that um, high glucose levels can actually uh, speed up the process of the, the cell death when, in interacting with the thiamine. So that's typically what you see in the emergency setting. And then the person, um, if it's you know, really severe with malnutrition, they're going to be hospitalized for a few days and then transition to another level of care. And that's typically uh, some kind of physical rehab facility, again, depending on other things that might be going on with the individual. Uh, and I'll discuss placement in just a minute. So after the emergency room, after that initial hospitalization, the family is kind of left with a, okay, now what? Uh, what do we do with this individual? How do, we, um, how do we move forward with any kind of treatment? And some of the typical areas that are discussed are medication, uh, therapy or counseling, physical rehabilitation, occupational issues, and living arrangements. So one question I, I frequently get is, are there any medications available? Um, and the answer is kind of a yeah, but. Yes, there are uh, medications that have been developed uh, through research on Alzheimer's um, that work on acetylcholine, or ACH. And ACH is a neurotransmitter, which is a chemical that helps the brain cells talk to each other. And it plays a role in learning and memory, and low levels have been linked to Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. So these medications that target ACH um, have been prescribed for patients with other forms of dementia, including Korsakoff syndrome. So that's the yeah. The but of that is there's really no way to predict who can benefit from these medications. And I really caution um, caregivers about getting a sense of false hope that these can work. Uh, personally, um, I have an uncle with Korsakoff syndrome uh, who was put on Aricept immediately, and it was kind of new at the time. And for about two years, which is our initial window of recovery, uh, he did pretty well. And he was living almost um, independently. We just turned his stove off. And he was able to walk across the street to the store and shop for himself. And uh, he wasn't uh, working. But other than that, he was living independently. Um, and it was wonderful. But over time, that benefit has faded. He's still on the medication. But it really isn't helping him as much as it used to. Uh, so people really do get a uh, mixed response from this, um, but it is an option people can look into. Um, other medications that can be helpful if the person is experiencing severe mood swings or anxiety or difficulty sleeping, uh, there are medications um, for, uh, like for example, antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds, that can be helpful. But I do recommend waiting a period of time to allow the brain to heal naturally. If alcohol was involved, um, alcohol and other drugs are already depleting these neurotransmitters that help with mood and anxiety. Um, so the brain will naturally try to heal and try to regain its balance after the person abstains. So we want to give the brain a chance to heal because if these are prescribed too quickly, it can sometimes backfire. And I always encourage families um, to seek out a psychiatrist uh, to help with these medications just because the delicate balance of neurochemistry, yes, primary care providers, um, are wonderful resources, and they can prescribe these medications, but the best route is through a psychiatrist. 
Um, I'm often asked about therapy. Is there any kind of um, memory therapy or any kind of counseling we can do to help with these issues and these symptoms? For the family members, yes, I recommend that all caregivers um, get some kind of professional support because it's very challenging. It's, it's a very long journey. Um, but as far as the individual, the only thing that um, I've personally seen in the research that's been beneficial is classical conditioning, and that's a very basic type of therapy where we pair a stimulus to an outcome. It's a type of learning, a rote learning. And uh, if you have heard the, the famous study of Pavlov's dogs where he paired the ringing of the bell with the treat and the dog salivated, this is the kind of training we're talking about. And the reason it works is because it acts on the cerebellum, which is not an area that we typically see affected uh, by Korsakovs. Um, and this has been used in extreme cases if a person is fearful uh, to their care staff at their facility, for example, because they're strangers and they're not used to seeing different caregivers or, you know, nurses do change shifts. They, you know, aren't 24-7. Um, so if they have a new caregiver walking in the room and they have a fearful or aggressive reaction, we can help them calm that down by, uh, over time, pairing a consistent presentation of that person to the individual. Uh, so one example I've seen is um, the... A uh, caregiver walked in at the same time of day, every day, wearing blue scrubs only and had the same kind of script, walking in saying, good morning, Mr. Jones, it's 8 o'clock, my name is Sheila, here's your breakfast and your morning paper. And it was pairing that consistency every time this individual saw someone with blue scrubs who greeted them and brought them um, breakfast or dinner uh, with a newspaper or something else they enjoyed, they learn to no longer be fearful because they, over time, were able to connect that person in the blue scrubs with someone that was going to be helpful, not going to harm me. And again, that's kind of in the more severe cases. Um, physical rehabilitation can be extremely helpful with uh, people who have suffered malnutrition and physical atrophy of the muscles because they're going to be weak, and weakness can lead to falling. And if you think about it for a minute, someone who has had uh, memory and cognitive issues, if they break a hip and suddenly have to go into the hospital, that can be a very difficult situation because they're not going to understand where they are. They're going to be very fearful. They're going to need someone with them at all times. It can be very challenging for all involved. So uh, not only is physical activity just good overall and improve their quality of life, we really want to prevent injury um, due to fall, due to that poor coordination. And also, if it's due to alcohol abuse, they probably weren't in the best physical health before their diagnosis, so they're going to have some catching up to do. Occupational considerations. Um, if the individual was working at the time of their illness, uh, the family is kind of left to deal with what, you know, what happens as a result of suddenly having to leave your job. And if they're a professional, that could get a little tricky. So some things to consider that often get overlooked is contacting human resources to see what the person, you know, if they had disability benefits or insurance, um, health care benefits, any other matters related to that person's profession, and anything the family may have to do to basically get this individual into essentially early retirement, um, is those, those steps have to be taken and can be overlooked, unfortunately, in you know, a time of crisis. On the other side of the diagnosis moving forward, um, helping the person engage in some kind of hobby or light work is going to be very helpful for them um, mentally and physically. Oftentimes people suddenly have to go to a new facility, they're in a new community, they're not sure how to act. Um, I've seen a lot of cases where getting that person involved in some kind of social role or light work around the facility can be very helpful to helping them feel connected, um, meeting new people, um, getting to know their environment a little faster. And again, having any kind of routine and sense of purpose is going to be good for them. Living arrangements. This can be a very complicated issue, and I, you know, this is only kind of a brief overview. But ideally, we want the person to be in a least restrictive environment and is similar to how they were living before they were ill, if possible. But we have to balance many things, safety issues, uh, the extent of the burden on the caregiver. They may not be able to suddenly drop everything and take care of this individual. Um, and any kind of recovery you're going to get is going to happen fast. It's going to happen in the first one, maybe two years of the illness. Honestly, that's as good as you're typically going to get. So it's helpful to determine 
that uh, least restrictive environment initially, but be planning for that higher level of care with time. And again, I don't have time to really discuss the more intricate issues of selecting a level of care. Um, feel free to, to contact me if you have specific questions, and I'll do my best to, to uh, consult and guide uh, where I can. Um, but this can be very, very tricky. So utilizing any resource you have before that individual leaves, leaves the hospital as far as a caseworker or social worker uh, really can be helpful. So what is the prognosis? I get this question a lot. And I'm going to split this off into uh, talking about the Wernicke's encephalopathy and the Korsakoff syndrome because, again, these uh, diagnoses can be connected or often discussed interchangeably. With the encephalopathy, that initial brain swelling, mortality rate is anywhere between 10 and 20 percent. It can get pretty high if not caught and treated early. Now, the initial physiological symptoms can improve with thiamine treatment because, again, that thiamine is what's causing the swelling. So if we get thiamine uh, injected or intravenously very quickly, you can see the brain swelling go down. But about half of those people um, in studies have shown that they're still going to have some kind of physical effect. Again, anytime you're talking about brain damage, you're not quite sure what you're going to end up with. But typically, the issues have been with the eye paralysis and motor function. And again, those are individuals that have not progressed into the Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, with Korsakoff's, complete recovery is highly unlikely because of the brain damage. Um, we know that people are estimated to use long-term care facilities like nursing homes twice as long as people with other types of dementia uh, for two reasons. One, they're about, on average, 10 years younger than other dementia patients when they go into the system. And also, um, typically, once you address the issues of malnourishment and physical therapy, Unless there's some pre-existing condition, the other parts of the system are acting, you know, are, are functioning well. Um, they can live longer lives because it's just the cognitive and, and mood impairment that you're dealing with uh, a lot of times. So the focus, I, I really try to help families shift that focus from analyzing that possibility of recovery and focusing on that, unfortunately, to having to shift to creating this plan of managing the new normal and planning for that progressive decline as the person ages. Uh, you know, it's very unfortunate, and again, this is a, prevent a preventable syndrome, but when it happens, we're kind of left to pick up the pieces, and um, I really try to um, discourage families from getting this false hope because the prognosis for any kind of complete recovery is not good. Um, but again, there's still much of the brain we don't know about, so hopefully with, with research and more prevention efforts, um, you know, we can improve outcome and, and prevent people from even getting to this point. So kind of the rule of thumb, looking at the research, about a quarter of people um, that are diagnosed will make a good recovery. They've caught it early, put good therapies in place, uh, maybe gotten some medications if needed um, to help stabilize them, and, and they're somewhat functional. Uh, about half of people will have a partial recovery. So in these situations, they are typically not aware of their illness. They need that lifelong support. They're um, in some type of assisted living. Uh, and 25% will have no recovery and need lifelong supervision, meaning they really need that help day to day to function and take care of themselves. So that was part three. That kind of wraps up a uh, closer look at Korsakoff syndrome. If you have any other questions or any other topics you'd like to see me cover, please feel free to uh, leave a comment or get in touch with me. Thank you.